There is no need to worry. That's how St. Paul begins his second reading for us today. Some translations put it even more strongly. Do not worry about anything at all. And for those who like archaic language, be nothing solicitous. So that's something we can begin with. How are you finding that teaching? Is your life structured by worry? Maybe even right now. Probably we could give a, a couple of responses to St. Paul. You might say, well, Paul, that's rich coming from you. You don't have a mortgage to pay. You don't have a child at school that's not getting the support that he should be getting. You don't have family that's unwell. You don't have a relative that maybe is coming to the end of their life and isn't right with God and you're worried about that. How can I not worry about these things? Is probably what you'd say back. But Paul, you know, he did have some pretty, pretty bad stuff going on in his life when he wrote this to the Philippians. He had all these new church communities he had founded, new converts. They were all across the Mediterranean and he had practically no way of connecting with them. He didn't know if they were keeping their faith or falling back into old ways. Some of them he had heard were being threatened by violence. And on top of this, when Paul wrote this letter, Paul was actually chained up in prison. He was in some jail in Rome, waiting to be put on trial, knowing that quite possibly he would be executed, and that he would never get round to keeping the promises he had made to visit to all those churches, and that it was quite likely that the Roman authorities might even spread a rumour that Paul had died abandoning his faith. Imagine that. So this is the Paul who tells the Philippians, do not worry about anything. He had plenty of things that he genuinely cared about, obviously. But in the entire letter to the Philippians, you don't get any impression that he's allowing these things that he cares about to become worries. So what's the difference? Well, when you care about something, you do what you can to deal with the situation. You do everything in your power. You pull all the strings you can to achieve the result. But worrying is, after you have done this, letting the topic rise again and again in your mind. When you've got no further power over the situation, nothing to add to the conversation in your mind, just replaying it. And St. Paul says, do not do this. There are probably some really good psychological reasons for this. I don't know if you've come across this um, diagram, the worry tree, um, like a helpful device to try and help you sift through worries and let go of them, realizing your powerlessness over different issues, uh, and then trying to, to let go of them. Basically, from a psychological point of view, you can't be happy if you're always worried and if you're worried about the future, if you're worried about the future, you can't make the most of the present moment, which is all that really exists anyway, in a very real sense. But Paul, unlike the psychologist and the worry tree diagram, he's got a bit more to tell us. He doesn't just say, you know, put the brakes on worrying. Um, he gives a positive alternative to the temptation to worry. He says, do not worry about anything. But if there is anything you need for, pray for it. Asking God for it with prayer and thanksgiving. So rather than letting the things we care about just to rotate in our minds, he tells us to hand these concerns to God. Like you, you take them out of your in-tray and you place them into his. You forward the uh, email. After all, you have done what you physically can. You are powerless. And God, he is the Lord of the universe and is totally powerful. So rather than let the matter cycle in your mind, speak openly, honestly, and completely about it with God. Lay before him exactly why you care about the issue, not in vague language, but in totally concrete particulars. Spell it out. Bring to God the thing that most frightens you that you think might result from the situation, and also the outcome that you would really love to see if it is his will. Like I said, this needs to be totally honest, and it probably needs to be repeated. 
You might remember uh, a few months ago I, I said about this thing, the Surrender Novena, the Surrender Novena, which says that we should repeat the following phrase, which can be really helpful. Oh Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. And as you say that, you try and envisage the problem being handed over to him. And then you've got to leave it with him. The temptation is to kind of like claw it back again. Oh Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. Sometimes as you lay the situation before God, you come to realize that the thing you are super concerned about is maybe not that bad, or that even if it is bad, you at least now know with all certainty you've handed over the situation to the one who knows the whole matter far better than you do, and who loves all those who are affected by the situation infinitely more than you do. And that's really something to try and, to try and take in. You know, there's a famous story about Pope John the 23rd. You might have heard this. When he was going to bed at night, he was tempted to worry about all kinds of things going on in the church, as we can only imagine. But as soon as he turned out the lights, after his prayers, he said one kind of final prayer. He would turn to God and say, It's your church, Lord. You look after it. I'm going to sleep. And I expect he probably had to repeat that over and over again. Oh, you know, we can do the same. He is your child, Lord. You look after him now. I'm going to bed. You made me, Lord. You promised not to give me more than I can bear. I'm going to bed. Let's look at what St. Paul says again. Do not worry about anything. But if there is anything you need for, pray for it. Asking God for it with prayer and thanksgiving. Let's think about that last bit. Asking God for it with prayer and thanksgiving. Initially, that phrase seems kind of weird. How can you ask for something with prayer and thanksgiving? You know, that, that seems like, um, isn't thanksgiving the response to when you get an answer? Um, how can you ask for anything with thanksgiving? Some people uh, say that asking God with thanksgiving is paying attention to all the blessings currently in your life and maybe remembering all the tricky situations God has got you through in the past. I know that definitely helps me. Usually I can smile to myself and think, wow, that situation two years ago was far worse than this one. And here I am now. The worst possible outcome didn't happen. And hopefully I'm still one of God's friends and in the state of grace. But it's likely that the verse doesn't mean that. When Paul says, ask God with prayer and thanksgiving, he's probably referring to the Eucharist, the, ma the Mass, because the Greek word for Mass is thanksgiving. So when there are these two nouns, ask, ask it with prayer and thanksgiving, he's talking of two different things, praying about it yourself and, ma and Mass, Eucharist, thanksgiving. So we can understand the verse in this way. Do not worry about anything, but if there is anything you need, pray for it, asking God for it with prayer and by bringing it to Mass. At Mass, you see, it isn't just you praying on your own. Obviously, we're all united together, but above all, at Mass, we unite our intentions to the sacrificial prayer of Jesus as he offers uh, his life and all of our lives to the Father. So it's no wonder that Paul recommends people to bring their worries to the Mass. At the moment of the Eucharistic prayer, that's when we should pray, place all our worries or concerns onto the altar. We should consciously, consciously offer them, hand them over to Jesus to present to his Father at, at the moment of consecration. So like, as I elevate the host, you've got to try and imagine all of your concerns being passed through a window into the presence of God in heaven. And that's the reason why many people try to come to Mass every day, because that happens. Their concerns and worries are carried up by Jesus into the presence of his Father. They're united to his sacrifice. Okay, so one final thought. The result. St. Paul tells us when we do this, when we hand our cares over to God, both in, both in personal prayer 
and through the Mass, we get a certain and sure result. Here it is. And that peace of God, which is so much greater than we can understand, will guard your hearts and thoughts in Christ Jesus. Paul knew a lot about being guarded. You know, he says, guard your hearts and thoughts. Well, he knew a lot about being guarded because right at that moment, he was in prison being surrounded by these officers. But the only guard he was aware of in his life, the only guard he wanted to talk about, was the peace of God guarding his heart and thoughts. And he says we can experience that, that we should experience that. All the other readings today about God looking after the vineyard, they reminded us of all God has done for us in the past and all he promises to do for us. With that in mind, we should be so confident in definitively handing over our worries to him. And then letting our lives be ruled and guarded by the peace of God, greater than anything we can possibly anticipate. A peace able to overcome and dissipate every worry we are facing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.